Hello, everyone. I'm Deborah Alferona. I'm the moderator for this panel. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. So this is the non-obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. And again, my name is Deborah. I am a reporter for CBS news stations across the country, and I tell stories here in Washington, D.C. And why I'm so excited about this panel is because I've always strived to tell stories of diverse voices, people who need to have their voices amplified, stories that need to be told, and stories that can change your life giving different perspectives. And I'm so excited about this panel. Okay, let me just get right to it. It's my honor to be speaking with Rebecca Coakley, Jyoti Sarda, Jackie Huba, Ketty Esquivel, and Angela Ward. The last two will be joining us shortly. And thanks to our organizers, the team at Non-Obvious non Company. Okay, this is going to be amazing. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me. Appreciate it. Okay, I wanna get right to things. We don't have time to waste. Okay, so what I wanna do first is talk to Jyoti about your film. We even have a clip of it that we can play. So why don't, why don't we do that? Let's play that and then we're gonna to get to it, okay? In the history of this country, any guesses out of 11,000 people that have served in the United States Congress, how many women of color have served? There is this assumption that black people don't vote, that Latinos are not American citizens, that Asian Americans are Republicans, and that young people are wholly unreliable. I want you to understand that who I am is a product of a movement. There are not enough people on the inside that look like me. People aspiring to be leaders in this country, they need to go through women of color because we're making our voices known. When I say I'm a social justice seeker, I'm a mama for justice or all these things, that's where I'm saying I'm American. I don't need to say it. I, I act like an American. Candidates do not normally talk to people in the Asian American community because historically speaking, we are the community that turns out to vote at the lowest rate. So we want to change that here today. We're no longer asking for permission to do what we need to do. We're going to do it, and we're going to lead from the top, and people need to see it. The sort of traditional notions of what's possible in American politics are being challenged every day. Elections are important, but our lives are on the line. Elections are important. Sisters and brothers, it's about building power in our community to win what is right. Except the communities that need to be brought in reflect the new American majority. They're young, they're brown, they might speak another language. And there's a lot of us. Oh. I'm excited about the fact that women of color are now coming into our own, that we're standing up and taking our rightful place in the pantheon of leadership, that we're changing what the face of leadership looks like. It is a new day, there's a new coalition, and ultimately we're gonna push this country forward because there's more of us than those that seek to do us harm. I have to clap, I have to clap. Oh my goodness, and she could be next. Oh, it's so exciting. What impact, what impact do you hope that that film has? Oh, well, um, so first of all, it's a two-part series. Okay. Uh, and the second uh, episode definitely delves into much of the organizing work in Georgia that is, I think, becoming quite well-known, you know, the results of which changed actually the anticipated outcome of the Georgia Senate runoffs in many ways. Um, what I hope really happens is not only the understanding of you know full throated participation in our democracy and how important that is but also a realization that there are uh people out there these organizers who have been working to kind of build their communities up build the power in those communities for ever i mean they've been doing it for a long time so we often in this country focus 
on exciting candidates, but we don't necessarily think about sort of the structure of how we go about uh, executing democracy. And part of that has to do very much with citizen engagement and community engagement. And, and that's what I find ultimately exciting at, after, you know, of course those amazing candidates who won in 2018, but now, um, you know, just this vision for what we all can do together in terms of engaging day in and day out. Was there anything that you learned while following these women that maybe surprised you? Anything you learned and you were like, oh, wow. Well, I, I think the the thing that was interesting is my partners, um, the directors, Marjan Safinia and Grace Lee, I mean, we and there was this team of um, directors who actually followed all these candidates. We thought we were, you know, doing a documentary series about running for office and the importance of diversity in elected officials. And absolutely, I think that is something that was interesting. But ultimately, it's what I just mentioned that was surprising, but also really exciting. We ended up really falling in love and um, and, and finding that the, the organizers themselves, the people who were actually turning out the vote were the real story or the um, like sort of the evergreen part of the story. Wow, I, I can imagine that making that film changed your life and you probably, uh, well, I shouldn't say you probably, let me ask you, have you heard from lots of people who've seen it and what what are they saying? Well, they say that it it, it is, it, <laughs> I mean, it's a little funny to talk about, um, you know, people's reactions, but they feel seen. You know, a lot of people in this country don't feel seen by the political process. And when you watch this and you watch, you know, it's not just black women that you see there, but you see, you know, people from the AAPI community. I mean, there's all different communities that go out, um, the native community, and they feel seen uh, and they feel like, there's a sense of hope and maybe a little bit of inspiration because we are going through some really traumatic times um, as a country. And the idea of just sort of joining in community with uh, your fellow neighbors and you know whoever is out there and, and really just sort of fighting for your values and um, working to make a better uh, neighborhood or get in a better city is um, definitely something that I think we could all rally around. Feeling seen. You really just, you hit the nail on the head there because isn't that what everyone really wants? And so many communities don't feel seen. And that's why stories are so important to tell. Mm. Uh, speaking about feeling seen. So I wanna ask Rebecca a couple of questions. Rebecca uh, Coakley, the director of the Disability Justice Initiative. One in five people have a disability. And so I don't know that we, know how many people in government or in politics who are representing all of us in America have a disability. What's the reflection? Do you know? Well, I think we're at a really pivotal point right now to have that conversation. Uh, members of Congress just endured probably one of the most significant traumas in our nation's history. And trauma in itself is a disability. And so I'm gonna be really curious to see how the events of, of um, the Capitol insurrection, I guess we're, we're calling it, impact the kind of policies we see as Congress. Um, are we going to see an increase in mental health education and funding for mental health services and funding for trauma supports? Um, also, the coronavirus is going to create the largest boom in the disability population since AIDS and HIV in the 1980s or before that polio. Every time we've seen a, a significant shift like this, we've seen policy have to adjust to it, whether it was more funding for special education whether it was increased funding on community-based services. And so I think there's a real opportunity to actually sit down and talk about who comes part of the disability community. And when it comes to our policymakers, we get the best. I mean, we get Tammy Duckworth, we get mm -hmm. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, we get Congresswoman Katie Porter, all three of whom identify as members of the disability community. And that matters because you know, I think as everyone on this on this um, Zoom or on this panel would agree, you can't be what you can't see. And mm. for so long, people with disabilities 
have been physically and socially isolated by an ableist country, by ableist policies that, you know, quite literally, we've only had the ADA for 30 years, and yet still 60 to 80 percent of voting places in this country violate the law. So we're still mm -hmm. struggling to access the basic fundamental rights of our democracy um, 30 years after it became law. Mm. Wow, that really hits you. There's so many things. I, I'm taking notes because everything that you're saying, Gioti said, it, it's just hitting me in such a, a really meaningful way. You know, I did um, interview Senator Duckworth when she came to lay flowers um, by um, where uh, there was, I guess, um, a, a, sorry, I'm trying to think of the, the word. Um, <laughs> And I can't think of it right now because you know what? I've been working at the Capitol for the last week and I've worked overnight. And uh, still, you know, we talk about trauma as a disability. And I can absolutely see so many people there who are, will be dealing with that in the future. Um, when she went to lay flowers by Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, casket outside and she brought her daughters there to show them you know, this woman changed the world, you know, how many women have done what she's done? Um, it's just really mind boggling. She was such a wonderful person to talk to. You know, interestingly, you're talking about the fact that coronavirus is going to now um, generate, you know, more people that have differing abilities because of that. And I don't think that's anything that anybody is talking about right now. Um, what can we say to, um, to kind of hit that home, Rebecca? the right language, we don't say differing abilities. That's a word that non-disabled people made up to make yourselves feel comfortable. Most of the wow. modern euphemisms, whether it's special needs, differently abled, handicapable, differing abilities, those were created by non-disabled people. The reason that it's the Americans with Disabilities Act is because Americans with disabilities are comfortable with the word disability. Disability is a protected group when it comes to civil rights protections. You, you don't have a civil right to accommodations because you learn differently. You have it because you have a learning disability. And so it's really important that we as a country actually get behind the fact that people with disabilities have civil rights and it's because of the specific language that we use and we need to reinforce the use of that language. The only folks that have made disability stigmatized as a community are non-disabled people, not us. So we need y'all to get it together and, and we're waiting for that. And when that happens, we'll have a party, we'll celebrate y'all, we'll do an Instagram post, maybe a TikTok dance. Um, but we're really looking forward to that. <laughs> I love you, Rebecca, that's awesome. And you're right, but words do matter. I'm a storyteller, Jyoti makes films, she's a storyteller, words matter and our whole entire life exists in words. Uh, speaking of words, Jackie, you've written two, wait, no, you've written many books, actually, just two that I have written down right here. Uh, Jackie Huba, I want to talk to you a little bit. You have started a, a nonprofit, and, and I just absolutely love it. I've watched your talk. Um, I actually also watched your talk, Rebecca. Um, if, I don't know if you have a talk, Jochi, or if you have a talk, Kathy, but if not, I'm going to be watching your talks, okay? Um, and so you're the founder and executive director of Drag Out the Vote. What made you start Drag Out the Vote? And tell us, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've um, I've never been an activist or really involved in politics at all. My background is uh, marketing. I worked at IBM. I've written a couple of books on marketing. Um, but after the 2016 election, I really realized that uh, I had not been doing nearly enough. And I realized also that 100 million people didn't vote in that election. I'm someone who voted maybe every four years. Um, my fourth book was on drag. And I uh, have been in sort of the, the burgeoning uh, drag, I would say, industry in the US in the last seven years. Um, meeting RuPaul, he gave us a quote for the cover of the book. I've interviewed lots of queens from RuPaul's Drag Race, some of which were my really good friends. And so after getting involved in local Austin um, advocacy groups to um, get more people voting, in 2019, I just thought I, I needed to do something bigger. And you know, drag queens, drag artists have always been at the forefront of the civil rights um, initiatives in the LGBTQ community. And so knowing all my, you know, all these folks in drag, I thought, what if we could mobilize uh, the biggest movement of drag artists in the country, which had never been done at a national scale, 
to register folks and to get them out to vote. Um, there was also statistics I learned uh, about the LGBTQ community and that one in five LGBTQ people were not registered or didn't vote. And so all of this non-participation was just gnawing at me like we've got, we've got to get more people's voices heard. And so that's why uh, in 2019, I launched Drag Out the Vote with all my uh, drag artist friends. And because of this, I think the success of things like RuPaul's Drag Race, which has been a television show, groundbreaking show for 10 years, we have these celebrity drag artists who have millions and millions and millions of LGBTQ followers, young followers of all stripes. And so that was really the goal was to build this the, the political um, movement of drag arts across the country. How do you get more people of LGBTQ, like how do you get them involved in politics? How do you, how do you mobilize this group? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we wanted to do, not just using sort of our national co-chairs who are all from Drag Race, but we reached out to drag artists of all stripes across the country. Also, there's lots of different types of drag. So you hear these terms, drag kings, drag queens, um, lots of different types of drag. I, I do drag, I'm a cisgender, straight woman who does drag. Every, everyone can do drag. There are drag artists all over the country who have long been activists. You know, drag artists have always been activists from Stonewall to the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and the AIDS crisis in the 80s. So we reached out to drag artists all over the country. We recruited 300 drag artists in 44 states to get out the vote in their communities. And we're a nonpartisan organization. So we recruited folks who just had a passion for getting their communities involved. And they know their communities. We um, we started with doing you know things in person in January, February, March by registering voters at drag events across the country, and then went purely digital from March on, just trying to help people understand that there's so many issues that they care about, and unless their voices are heard um, at the ballot box, those issues will not be addressed by their elected officials. And so that was really our goal was to get as many people registered and out to vote as we possibly could. And you said something in your talk that really stuck with me. Um, everybody is in drag. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, RuPaul has a great quote that we're born <laughs> naked and the rest is drag. So we're all sitting here, by the way, in drag, uh, ladies, <laughs> because the drag is really what you put out to the world in terms of the persona that you're creating and everything that, that you do. So. Uh, yeah, it's a very universal concept, and um, it's just amazing to see how the fan base for drag in the country has expanded because of things like RuPaul's Drag Race. But I think, you know, the the community is united in wanting to see change. Um, the Equality Act is something, <clears throat> excuse me, that we advocate for um, because there's still a lot of discriminatory laws around the country. We do not have a national um, equality um, uh, legislation passed a lot of LGBTQ laws on the books where folks are discriminated against. So there's so many things that we do advocate for, um, even as a nonpartisan organization. I just absolutely love everything that everyone's doing here to change the world in in small and large ways. I I want I was I had a question for Katie. We lost her for a moment. Rebecca, can I ask you a little bit more? Uh, you have a new opportunity with the Ford Foundation. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to announce that I will be the first program officer for the Ford Foundation for the Office of the President focusing on giving to disability rights causes. Wow. And so do you sleep? I have three <laughs> children. What's I have three children like we're in a pandemic. We have a recession. I'm 14 blocks from the Capitol. I don't remember what sleep is. No, no, no. You haven't slept in a while. I can imagine. You, I, you had me at the kids. Four, four years. Four years without sleep. Oh, oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, if you can do all the things you're doing on no sleep, then I better step it up, okay? I'm going to shut up about the fact that I was at the Capitol all night. No, you need to sleep. Like, sleep is activism. Like, sleep is rebelling. Like, that's the point that we're sleep at Sleep is activism, right? Writing like, it down. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a Twitter handle called the, what is it the nap um, the nap ministry that like actively focuses on sleep and rest as as an act of revolution, and I strongly abide by that. <laughs> I absolutely love that. There you go. Um, okay, speaking of Twitter, thank you for that. That's what we call a segue in TV, right? Um, 
I was looking at every, of course, because I got to do a little bit of research on y'all. Um, and I was looking at Jyoti's Twitter bio. And you can really tell a lot about a person at a Twitter bio because it's got to be like this, right? You've got to get it right there. So um, former international entertainment marketer, unapologetic brown girl fighting for a better future producer. I love it. Uh, so tell us more about, well, hey, let, let's talk about current events, everything that's going on at the Capitol. Obviously, that's that was really um, alarming, uh, is still alarming. But before that, we actually had an election in Georgia. And so did you watch this? And what were you thinking? It was it was the biggest story until everything happened. Well, you know, it's funny. I, that morning, uh, I was actually sort of celebrating. I mean, keep in mind, we had followed many of these organizers and say who fought of the New Georgia Project, uh, Latasha Brown, Black Voters Matter, and on and on, um, you know, and so we were celebrating um, because we knew the phenomenal work that they had done and would bring to this process. And what they did was, you know, register more voters between the presidential election and actually that Senate runoff. They are tireless. And, um, you know, it's not just about the win, which of course was very exciting. It's also about bringing more people into the process. I mean, you know, we're here talking about diversity. It's not just diversity for diversity's sake, diversity for winning. It's so that more voices can be heard, right? I mean, these are, there's a tradition with some folks in politics to sort of silence voices. Um, or, to, you know, that's a method of winning. And what we're talking about here is bringing more people in and really ensuring that their um, their vote matters. And, and I know that sounds a bit, I mean, we all talk about that, but, you know, that to me, that's what Georgia reflected. Was like really uh, behind me, you see, um, you know, this goddess Kali and she has multi arms, right? And each of those arms are supposed to represent you know, the uh, powers of another God. And, you know, so it's like sort of an Indian version of the Avengers. And that's what it felt like in Georgia. It felt like all these communities were working together for a sh shared purpose and they all had their role. It wasn't any one person. So I, I think that's, for me, that's just an exciting vision overall of a future that we could rally around. Gotcha, thank you. Ketty, do we have you? Making sure Ketty is there. Are you there, Ketty? Darn, we've lost her. I really wanted to talk to her about executive Latina leaders in action. Um, and we just lost her again. But did you follow follow people? Uh, did you follow any, any politicians who were Latina? Yes, uh, we followed Veronica Escobar, who mm. um, not only did we... We're lucky to have her. She took Beto O'Rourke's congressional seat down in El Paso and was very much a voice for um, the border and and for that those types of communities and uh, just and she also has been an outspoken member uh, in Congress for those issues. And then we f followed Maria Elena Durazo. I live in California and she's a state senator here. But what's really important is she's a longtime labor leader of um, you know, sort of hotel workers and, and really um, the, let's say the lower end of the labor spectrum or the lower wage end of the labor spectrum. So uh, I felt like those two voices were really exciting to listen to and, and to hear them represent their population, you know, their communities again. You know, I've got some questions that I want to ask all of all of you. Um, and so I'm going to go around. That's OK. So what is the question that you're most tired of hearing about what you do? And what would you like to say about it so you never have to answer it again? And I'll start with anyone who wants to jump in, because I know you don't always have the answer right away. Like I couldn't find that word before. So if you don't have an answer right away. I'll let somebody else jump in. The one question you're just tired of hearing people ask you about what you do. 
Well, I think for, for us, I mean, we're a new organization, but I know that we're going to get this question, which is like, what are you guys going to do? Uh, what, what are you guys going to do um, until the next election? Because mm. people forget that there's an election every year. What they mean is, you know, they think it's every four years. So we, what, what our job is in 2021 is to remind everyone that there is an election every single year. And these, you know, a lot of uh, in the off presidential years, you have state elections, local elections, city elections. There's so many elections across the country. And so for us is one, we have to remind people, you have to vote every year. Um, and there's so many opportunities to create change, even locally, uh, that you may not have thought of. So we're going to do a lot of civic education this year. We're going to expand, you know, our uh, drag, the drag ambassadors that we have in, into more cities and states so that they can help educate folks on what is happening and what, you know, what is at stake in the election in their community. Um, but that I think for us is like one of the most common misconceptions that there are and that we, we kind of have to make sure that we uh, let people understand that they, it, it's not just every four years, folks, it's, it's every year. That's great, thank you so much. All right, who's next? Who has a good answer for me? Who has any answer for me? <laughs> I'll go. Um, okay. For us, it's not, for the disability community, I say it's not as much of a question. It's it's an observation. And it's frankly the word inspiration. I hate the word inspiration. Inspiration, I am so over it as a, as a person with a disability that um, I think it's been used to actually marginalize us. And so often mm -hmm. what we get is we're told how inspiring we are. We don't wake up in the morning thinking, how can I go out and inspire a bunch of non-disabled people? We go out in the morning and think about the fact that we're having to fight for our health care, that our kids aren't receiving equal access in schools, that the bank by my house still doesn't comply with the law. And so I feel like I have to stand on my tiptoes in platform shoes to be able to put money in the ATM. And so I think often the, the role of inspiration and, and framing disabled people as inspirations, whether in politics, in pop culture, in media, um, really serves to infantilize us, to put us in a box and, and to, fetish us, uh, to fetishize us um, in a way that negates the political and economic and social capital and power that we actually have. And so if I could erase, you know, reframing your question to say like, what don't I want to hear? Like, I don't want to hear inspiring. I want to hear like the action that somebody actually took because they were educated by a disabled person, not like I'm so tired of coming off a stage or a microphone and being told, oh, you inspired me so much. Like, I don't care. I inspiration doesn't pay my pay my bills. Um, instead, you know, instead, tell me that you were so pissed off by what I said that you fought for change in your community, that you were so upset about, you know, what I woke you up to that you went and talked to your autistic relative about the fact that they're autistic and your family shames them all the time. Like, tell me how what we did actually made a difference instead of the fact that like, I made you feel like you got lost in a Hallmark store. Rebecca, you are so, you have such a great way of putting these things. Like you are really on it. So tell me then if people want to be allies, what can they go and do? What actionable advice do you have? What can they do now? Listen to the disabled people in your life. We're present in one third of households. Like chances are it's somebody you're related to, somebody you live with, um, the sister that drives you up the wall because she takes your clothes all the time, you know, the brother who's unreliable, your uncle who lives with mental illness, any number of people in your life live with a disability. Actually sit and think about the impact. Think about how it shapes family dynamics. Think about how it shapes the holidays. Think about what you went, you could be doing for your coworkers that have disabilities to make your workplace more accessible. Um, you know, if once once we get to the point of, of going back to work in a lot of cases, but like actually educate yourself instead of repeat, repeatedly asking disabled people to provide that labor for you. I would actually say pick up a copy of Alice Wong's Disability Visibility anthology, which is one of the top selling books as it relates to the disability community and has a series of pieces by a number of disabled authors to actually educate yourself. Um, turn off reality shows. They don't teach you anything. Um, and, and, you know, actually take some time to learn about the disability experience in America more than Helen Keller. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kedi, do we have you now? Yes, yes. Um, I think that's key. I want to just thank everyone uh, that's on this call and you, Deborah, for all your 
your questions. I think action is really the key of how we move things forward. Uh, mm -hmm. We have had two uh, historic and very challenging Wednesdays, uh, one after another. And I think now is the moment for us to continue into this power and the work that we're doing. Uh, Deborah, as you and I were chatting earlier, um, we're in an inherited conversation which does not allow for diversity uh, to really be present in the way that would represent the nation as a whole. I think right now we're in the moment that we can try and change that inherited conversation. It's not gonna be overnight. And many times when you're starting to uh, reach the promised land, if you will, um, you have tremendous pushback, which is what we're seeing right now. And so then I think you just need to redouble your efforts, as Rebecca was saying, and really find a way to get rid of the solution. Um, in Spanish, we have a saying, uh, un pasito para adelante, un pasito para atrás, you know, like, and we want to make sure um, we're really doing uh, two steps forward, right? Dos pasitos para adelante. Um, and uh, really trying to not be going back as much as possible and, and look towards how we can um, continue to bring the change that we're hoping for, for diversity and inclusion, and not let the challenges that we're seeing stop this tremendous work. And can you tell us a little bit about Executive Latina Leaders in Action? I wanna also just give you um, a little intro here that you're also the co-founder of Esquival McCarson Consulting. And so tell us about Executive Latina Leaders in Action and, and really what's the state of Latina leaders at this point? Sure. To Latina leadership and, and Hispanic leadership in general. In 2018, there was actually an article uh, by NBC that heralded that there were tremendous gains. Um, but in reality, again, if you look at the demographic uh, reality of who we are in this nation versus the numbers that we have, the numbers are still incredibly low for us to really be represented. Um, at the federal level, you'd have to double the numbers in Congress, you'd have to triple the numbers in the Senate. So there's still an incredible amount of work to do. Uh, my background um, has been in marketing and communications. Um, I also have done a political work and organizing work. So I, I directed the Latino outreach for a presidential campaign back in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, 13 days, uh, 13 years later, I see um, extraordinary difference, extraordinary difference, I think. And it really has to do with people, um, as, as was being shared earlier, um, stepping in to be the change that we want to see in the world. This is not going to happen overnight, and it's not going to happen with just um, a couple of individuals trying to create the change. Um, and, and so that's actually going back to your question about um, AYA, Executive Latina Leaders in Action, um, taking the work that I had done in the corporate sector, taking the work that I had done in the nonprofit sector, um, and also as an advocate, I wanted to try and create an organization where we as Latinas could come forward and continue to be a part of the solution. And so that was the vision of it was to take um, these you know, tremendous opportunities, blessings that we've had in the world to be able to succeed and uh, try and leverage that in a way that we can create um, structural and systemic change. Um, because as, as we talked about bringing it back to the beginning of our conversation, this, this is really an inherited conversation that permeates um, the history of our nation. And in order to change it, um, we all need to do our, our little bit. In Spanish, we have a saying, granito de arena, a little grain of sand. We all need to bring our little grain of sand to make a difference. And that's what I was hoping um, ella uh, would do. And Katie, uh, further to that, what can someone do as an ally to, to help? I think this very conversation, the fact that we come together in solidarity, I think that's the only thing that's really going to shift the equation. I know that, you know, we're struggling against some very difficult things and the conversation has become an either or. It has become a very binary conversation and it's become one which is very polarizing. And, and I think what we need to do is um, think about how we lift all boats. Um, how we come together to really create a world which is going to be beneficial um, for, for all of us. It's not, um, a, you know, a limited pie that we're dealing with here. Um, it's uh, we can create an abundance of opportunities. We can create abundance of affluence, um, and we can do so if we come together um, rather than trying to. Um, operate in a divisive way. And so I think, you know, us supporting each other, you know, Rebecca, everything that you said resonated so deeply with me. Um, my nephew is autistic and, um, you know, I just I really am so grateful for the tremendous work that you're doing. Um, you know, and I think uh, just as an example, right, of us, us coming together and what we can do to help each other. Um, and I think of, 
you know, the gains that have be, been made over the course of the last uh, several years, it really has been when people come together, regardless of their background, uh, to try, try and make a difference and to create a better world. Thank you, Kathy. Jyoti, I want to ask you also, you know, I really love what your film's goal is to show people all the work that went into these elections, which were successful in many ways. And so what do we miss when we don't have diversity in government? What are we missing? Oh, I mean, goodness. Well, just look at the changes that have happened in just, I mean, there's just been a percentage change. Um, let's just take Congress in, uh, you know, women of color, women and other um, diverse voices joining Congress. And you know, what you find is, first of all, those communities are represented. Isn't the point of government to represent? How can you represent if you don't have all the voices there? And um, I f it feels as though the new voices coming in um, are more are authentic because they're coming in for a, a different reason. It's not politics as a profession per se, but really there's a vision, a, a mission, if you will. And um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, well, our focus on, was on women of color, um, and we really chose that because we wanted to look at politics through the lens of both gender and race, because those do tend to be big limiters, if you will. Um, I feel there's, it's important to recognize all the different diversity of communities, not just uh, the way we label people, but also the fr different walks of life. Um, you know, it's very expensive to run for office. So that limits uh, people without means. It, it limits certain communities because they don't have those fundraising networks built in. And if we truly want better solutions to the challenges that we face, it usually comes from having more diverse points of view to really come up with something that addresses what everyone needs. So there's that very practical, uh, as well as a profound reason for uh, the need for diversity, in my humble opinion. So, <laughs> And what do you think that we can all do to bring about a more diverse government landscape? What can the average person do? Well, you know, the average person, look, it's a lot of work to be a citizen, honestly. It's a lot of work to vote. I think one of the things that the Rock the Vote campaign may have underscores, like you sort of, you know, just go there and it's 20 minutes. It's not, you know, sometimes people have to wait hours in line. They have to educate themselves. Um, and they, if to truly make a good decision, you know, you have to learn about the different candidates. So let's not you know, just the way Rebecca doesn't like the word inspiration, let's not make voting sound um, easy. It's not, it, but it's worth it. Um, the other thing I think we can do is for those of us, if you have the ability, when you see a candidate who's exciting in the primaries, you know, in the early stages, often we wait to see whether they're gonna make it, right? I think you need to get behind the, the people who really move you. And, and get behind them and don't use your head, use your heart a little bit more because it is very difficult uh, to come in as an outsider and to succeed. Our system is built uh, to reward incumbents and reward, uh, if you will, the wealthy. And so it's people, you will really show people power in action by uh, getting behind those candidates that speak to you, that make you feel seen, that make you feel uh, like you want to get involved. Um, and I feel like we had a lot of candidates rise up in the last four years for various reasons, okay? The circumstances seem to demand them. And I hope that continues forward because I'll tell you, I'm much more excited about our representatives these days. And um, I'm hoping uh, all of you who are here continue to support candidates from your communities, right? Uh, let's keep bringing them forth, letting them run, be, you know, so that, because when you run, you might win, so. And like Jackie says, hey, yeah. there is an election every year. <laughs> yeah. People don't realize. Build, building I mean, I'm sorry to yeah. jump in, but on that, our, our documentary um, was called And She Could Be Next. It's like any, if you run, you could be next. Absolutely.
Katie, do you have something to add? Building, yeah, yeah. Building on that, I wanted to say I think everything that was just said um, so so well. Um, but in addition to that, once we get our people elected, also helping to make sure they're set up for success. Uh, because many times what happens is, um, you're right, there, it is so challenging to get someone new in the door. You get them in the door, and then what? Um, and so being able to connect them with organizations that can support them with their work, advocate for, advocate for them to be able to hold um, meaningful positions uh, within the elected capacity that they have um, and continue to support in whatever way we can to make sure that um, the vision that um, we brought to trying to have them elected comes to fruition once they are in fact in office. What else am I not asking that I should be asking that all of us need to know? Can I ask for a vote? Because I'm tired of living in D.C. 12 blocks away from the Capitol and not having a vote, that would be really nice. We get some, of, we pay some of the highest taxes in the country and we still don't have representation. It's a little ridiculous. So if we're asking for stuff, yeah, I'd like a vote. That would be nice sometime soon. <laughs> okay, a vote. I got it written right here, <laughs> but seriously. Anyone else? What would you like? I'm, give, I'm handing out stuff here. I've got a vote for Rebecca. <laughs> who, wants, who wants something here? Well, here, okay, here's what we'd like to see. Um, we, uh, at uh, Drag Out the Vote, we advocate for the passage of the John Lewis Rights Voting Act because mm -hmm. there are so, so many things um, that I think, as someone said earlier, they continue to need to be fixed. I mean, voting is not easy. Registering to vote is not easy. I live in Texas. I live in Austin, Texas, and I am a, uh, I am a, a volunteer registrar which means I have to go get trained, take an oath. And that's how a lot of people get registered by someone talking to someone else in person. We don't have, you know, um, online voter registry. We don't have these things. We are 44th in voter participation in Texas. And that's one of the reasons why, because it's so hard. So all of these things that are being, um, you know, suppressing the vote, all of these things that, that for years have done this, we have got to fix those things. And so we have to have, uh, uh, easy access to the access to the ballot for so many people. So that's one of our big goals this year, and I really, really hope that um, that that will get passed this year by the administration. I agree. Kathy, any last any last uh, things you want to leave us with? You know, actually, you had a really interesting thing that you said earlier, and it's I'd kind like of to oh. have um agents see and they're able to make a difference um i think that many people have really become uh, disillusioned with what we've seen over the course of uh the last several years and i think if we can just remind people that uh, you know, this nation was left to us um, as a certain type of government. And whether that type of government um, perseveres or not has to do with our voice and how we leverage it and use it. And um, really, in order for us to have a government that's representative of our plurality, the way to do so is for each of us to feel that, that we can make a difference and we can be a part of the solution, um, whatever community you're a part of. And, and um, I'm big on solidarity. So I think conversations like these where um, we're lifting up the, the tremendous work that other individuals are doing um, and we're letting Letting people see that they can be a part of the chain. We're losing Ketty a little bit there, but you know what? I was she is speaking truth, and I can hang on and wait for that. Like I, I'm not hanging on her every word, regardless. Um, I have one last question for. Oh, I'm sorry, Jyoti. I was just gonna say, you know, I was listening to Ketty, and I know she was having a hard time. Uh, with the, her video, but I feel like uh, there's a phrase we sometimes use um, with the campaign around our documentary that there's an organizer in all of us. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the way to sum it up. I mean, look at the work that Rebecca and Jackie and Kat, yeah, all of us, all of us out there are doing that we each have influence over our 
community, even if it's uh, the folks in our family or the folks around that used to sit around our larger dinner tables. Um, and we have the ability to bring people in um, and we should use that ability. Absolutely. I had one last question and then uh, we are running out of time here. Um, but, you know, I, I want to talk about, we we're talking about selection, getting people out to vote. And then, of course, I've been covering, you know, every day for CBS about the elections, the allegations of widespread voter fraud that have been made that there is no evidence for facts. And what do you think that's going to do as far as voter confidence moving forward and, and, is, and in diverse communities? Anyone? Can anyone take that one? It's a tough one. This is Rebecca. I think that the most important thing that we can continue to do is lift up the state level leadership, the secretaries of state who've talked about the fact that these elections were fair. There mm. was not fraud. Um, you know, I, I used to work in retail and we used to say that um, uh, for a bad retail experience, you would tell uh, seven of your friends versus a good retail experience where you would tell three. And I really do think like consistency builds trust. Like we have to continue to reiterate that it was a fair election, it was a secure election. I think part of the challenge is the fact that since elections are run at the state level, you have different technology in every state. Like, and that, and it's designed that way. That's part of our democracy, whether or not we think it's the right thing or not. Because for us, it deals, it, it, you know, impacts accessibility in a lot of ways. But I do think, I mean, let's also be real. Like this didn't just like this, this hatred and this us versus them didn't just start with the election. The election gave a means for it, gave a vehicle for it. Um, but for a long time there, there has been racism, structural inequality, um, white supremacy at the root of voting. And when people suddenly see that they're not the majority anymore, and that there are people that want the country to go in a different direction. I mean, this is a this in a lot of ways is in some ways like the next reconstruction. And so we are seeing the backlash as a result of the fact that, you know, my, my dear friends, and I was so happy to see them in the documentary, Latasha Brown and Inse Ufut, like I love them both. They are easily two of my favorite people. Um, and millions of others around the country helped drive people to the polls in a way that has never happened before. Um, and just because they don't look like you doesn't mean it wasn't a fair election. I appreciate that. I do want to echo what Rebecca was saying. I was really glad to see that the secretaries of state for so many states um, who are the ones in charge of making sure that it's run fairly uh, did stand up and, and certify the results um, and put out statements very clearly. We have um, at Drag Up the Vote, we work with secretaries of states. Um, we work with Secretary Padilla of California, uh, Jocelyn Benson of, of Michigan, Nellie uh, Gorbea from Rhode Island, and so many more. So that they are sharing you know, what people need to know about the election. And so we use our drag ambassadors to get that word out. So I think it's, it's making sure that, that we combat disinformation with the right information, getting it out into the networks so that people know it's a trusted source from these secretaries of state. And I think we just need to continue to combat that um, disinformation with with making sure that the right information is getting out there so people know what is real and what isn't real. Well, uh, I want to underscore that because it is the work of my fellow panelists that, you know, we're all, it's relationships and organizing, right? right. So that that's how people end up really getting um, locked into or engaged into the political process anyway. So. Uh, if you have someone you know and you trust talking to you um, in uh, a language or a tone or in the uh, in the way that's appropriate to you, you're just that's the person you're going to listen to. And and so I think it's a lot of work. Um, it puts more work uh, to sort of combat that. But uh, I think that ultimately seems like that's what's been working. Like you said, there's an organizer in all of us, right? It is. Absolutely. I just want to thank you all so much for your time, for your voice, and for sharing everything that you did today. So this, everyone who's watching, is represented how politics and government is becoming more diverse. What a great panel. What a great discussion. It's been a part of non-obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. Thank you so much for watching. And of course, check out everything else. We have so many things here that you can watch. 
not just this panel, but so many others. Um, we've brought together voices from all genres, genders, geographies, and I really thank you. Again, I'm Deborah Alferon. Welcome to a special bonus of the show. You are watching the non-obvious Beyond Diversity Summit, and I have with me today Angela Ward from The Game Changers. I just had to have you on, and I'm so glad that you are here. Okay, tell us about The Game Changers. I know that you are changing the game all over the place, my friend. Yes, yes. So the Game Changers is pretty much um, mainly a political and business platform. And I added the social recently added the social piece um, last year um, in where I interview non um, per se real leaders, real political leaders, real business CEOs that they can come on. We can talk about their company. We can talk about their platform. And I focus on issues first and politics second. So even though we talk about politics, I talk about facts only. I interview the hardcore Republicans from the hardcore liberals. And that's what we mainly focus on. Wow. I don't know how you do all of it. So I know it's, it's, it's definitely, definitely difficult sometimes, but hey, we, we're getting through it. I love, <laughs> I love it. it. This is this called is Represented, right. how politics and government is becoming more diverse. And so my question is, you know, you interview people, and we're talking about diversity and, and you, like you just said, you interview a diverse set of people. Yes. What, what do you learn from people who maybe you don't hold the same view as? You know, as a person that's hosting, you know, the interview, I just want to be there to listen. If we can't communicate properly, there's no way that we can sit and listen to each other or understand each other's point. So the, the Game Changers platform, I wanted to provide a platform that is focusing on total issues and leaving the politics alone. The reason why I say leave the politics alone is because sometimes politics can bring lies, it can bring arrogance, and I just want to really just focus on the truth. So whether you are that hardcore liberal or you are, are that hardcore Republican, what do you feel that would change a certain direction, a certain angle of a, of a law, of an issue um, that everybody needs to pretty much focus on? And so even though, you know, it may be difficult sometimes uh, when they have a different uh, idea from myself, you know, I learned to just really um, uh, not say too many yeses, um, especially if I don't believe it because I want to stay true to myself. Um, but um, when focusing on um, when I'm talking about real facts, I do like to address the way that I feel if I do not believe in what they're saying. How do you encourage people to use their voice? You know, be honest, you know, it's all about telling the truth. Um, and I really stress that so much, you know, using their voice by uh, we use it by social media, even though I know recently with the incidents that are happening today, sometimes it's kind of hard to um, with freedom of speech. But, you know, you have to know how to use your voice. You have to know when to use your voice. So that, I think that is so important. But it's very important to express the way you feel, whether it's to family, whether it's to um, business or your job. It's always important to use your voice because your voice is really pretty much all you have if you don't have anything else. It must be so difficult in these times with everything that's going on, you know, we're talking a uh, post capital riot. Um, yes. You said truth. So true. And we all know that truth is a state of mind. Yes. For some people. How do you push back gently, but with a little bit of oomph on the truth? On the truth. You know, <laughs> Well, that's the thing. The truth is the truth. And regardless of how me or you feel or anyone feel about it, you know, um, if it's in black and white, that means it's the truth. If the numbers, if the numbers um, add up, that means it's the truth. So whether, you know, sometimes the truth hurts. Um, but I think once it, once we both, especially in the parties um, on the political aspect of it, once we come to common ground and understand it is what it is, it's in black and white. I think we can all come to the table and talk and say, hey, this is what it is. Um, this is the truth. Uh, uh, president Biden, he <laughs> will become the president. And at the end of the day, we can't we can't push out lines anymore because. 
everything was tumble after that. If if we do start pushing out false information, you will come down <laughs> pretty much. So, so what richness does diversity bring in government? I know you interview lots and lots of people um, of all different backgrounds and spectrums and political beliefs, but what richness does diversity bring to the array of people that you talk to? You know what? And, th- and this is to, to, to be able to interview um, uh, one of my top interviews was Secretary Ben Carson. Um, and of course, he's a conservative, but he's I wouldn't say he's a hardcore Republican because I do feel that there is a difference. But to um, by him being an African-American um, conservative is very different. I did feel proud to interview him. Um, I was quite surprised on some of the things that um, um, that interview um that came across in the interview, but I did respect that he was um, very truthful to some of the things that he that he believed in. Um, and we also have some mutual beliefs as well. Um, I do stand as uh, more independent um, because it helps me stay neutral in media and especially interviewing both sides of the aisle. But um, I just think that the richness of it as is, is really, um, excuse me, really just having top Democrats, top Republicans come on, and especially if they're African-American, it just really means a lot to me. And I hope that answers your question. But um, it's, it's, it's sort of special to me. Um, I know I had some um, issues early on when I first started the Game Changers. Actually, I was smart business talk then, but um because I was actually interviewing more Caucasian than anything, but, and there was a lot of, um, it seems as African-Americans, it seemed like they didn't really get into the media as much, um, more on the the, uh, Democrat end, but I, the more I got in it, the more they became comfortable with me knowing that I'm going to ask real questions. It really um, brought everything together. And speaking about government and diverse voices, what what do we miss when we don't have diversity in government? I think we've probably, we might all know the answer from the recent events, but I'd love to see what you think when we don't have diversity in government. We have to have diversity in, in government. That's a must situation, and I can I, I think you see the passion in my face, in my voice, um, and hear it in my voice on that. You know, if I don't see someone that looks like me, I'm going to feel a little un- uncomfortable. And so, years and years and years, we did not. I didn't see many people that looked like me in government. And when we had the first black president, I knew things were turning then. You know, I know a lot of people, you know, didn't like President Obama or and even some African-American African-Americans felt that he didn't, you know, do enough for black people. You know, but at the end of the day, you can't do everything that you want to do. And sometimes you can stay focused on one thing or a couple things and you think you're doing right. But we we can't please everybody. And so, you know, you just got to kind of take the bad with the good sometime. And um, but going back to your question, it's so important to see. I think the only person that I really felt um, that looked like me was Condoleezza Rice and um, Colin Powell. Um, Hey, I was like, wow, you know, they're really in top government. And so when I was younger, you know, that's the only people that was really up there like that. So it was just a pleasure to to have more diversity. And even with um, President uh, and President elect Biden now, he's going to be president tomorrow. But uh, with him and electing so many folks that look like me, I'm proud, you know, and, and I know a lot of people, and I'm going to, you know, say this on the air too, because it, it's so important to tell truth. You know, a lot of, um, I would say white conservatives and even, you know, I would say black conservatives too. They say, why you have to always bring up race? Why is race so important? Race is important because if we don't see enough of us and you want us to, to think about your ideology of something, that that plays a huge part in me agreeing with what you want me to do or me agreeing for your vote. 
You know, if you can't see it, how can you be it? That kind of just rings in my head. That is so true. Oh, wow. That is so true. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, with that being said, you inspire people just by being you. Yes. You know? that, that is, I mean, even with the story of, you know, Secretary Carson, you know, when he did that uh, major operation, that stuck with me for so long. Um, and then just to see him, you know, become the secretary of uh, secretary that it was just amazing. Um, and then um, also Condoleezza Wright, uh, Rice, that that was phenomenal to see a black woman. And even I will I want to say first lady Michelle Obama I, to have a black woman as the first lady in the White House. I never thought I would see it in my in my uh, 35 years of life. I never thought I would see that. And it's such an honor to to even have that. And now to to have, you know, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, like, it's just amazing to me. And I'm honored and honored to have a woman of color as Vice President. Let's talk about media because you straddled the line between media and politics. And so... Yes. What type of media do you gravitate towards uh, when you're looking for a diversity of opinions, backgrounds, races? Wow, that's, you know, that's a good one right there. So um, I actually look at all types of media, especially when it comes to politics, because um, also with the Game Changers, I try to, like I say, I, I focus on I focus on the truth facts, facts first and leave the politics alone. So I may, you know, look at CNN, I may look at Fox News, MSNBC, Roland Martin and see what everybody's thinking, what everybody is talking about. And then I then I research the facts. It's so important to research the facts. We can always talk about, you know, the propaganda. We can always talk about what uh, what's hot on the news now to, uh, or what the current president is doing now. We can do that. But what, what is the truth, the actual truth? So if we both, we, we both accept the truth on both sides, there shouldn't be an issue. We can all get along if we know that it's in black and white and it is the truth. And that's what I really, really stress on the game changers. And to be honest, that's why I've been so so accepted on both sides like i it's phenomenal you know and i, I want to say something this say something to this as well being a black girl and i'm going to say a black girl literally from the south side i stay in south georgia valdosta georgia to be is that live on the south side of town um went to um schools that the public school system on the south side of town that wasn't popular. Um, it was hard for me even to 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 be viewed on to be viewed from the other side. My my own people say, oh, why are you interviewing so many white people? Why are you interviewing so many, you know, these white politicians? Well, those are the only ones that come on the game changers because I was telling the truth. And and I don't know, I, I don't still don't understand that stigma. And I've still been, you know, trying to reach out and ask more questions um, on that and try to get, try to relate. Um, I recently uh, interviewed, well, the end of last year, I interviewed Reverend uh, Jesse, ja Jesse Jackson. That generation is totally different from today's generation, the baby boomer generation. Um, they are what you call hardcore liberals. And I, it, he's, it was a great interview, but it was so enlightening to see the difference, the dynamics of how millennials think, black millennial thinks, and from baby boomer, African-American, the way they think. So it's totally different and it just was enlightening. And I, But back to your question, I believe I was so accepted um, in media with interviewing both sides is because I told the truth. I said who I, where I came from, what I stand on. I still stand, I stand on Christian belief and, and I'm not ashamed of that. Um, but I, of course I have, I have hardcore liberal beliefs and I have hardcore conservative beliefs because that's who I am. So I, I think the best fitting for me is to be independent because I may agree with you and I may not agree with you. I think that there's something special about the way that you interview people. 
Thank you. That, yeah, I, I, I've watched you, obviously. I know you. And I think that that's a model that could be um, adapted to for people to get along. I think when people see other people, you know, the, the rush to judgment, oh, well, you believe this or you believe that. But if we're open-minded and just ask questions that are free of judgment in in honor of the truth, you can get an understanding of a person. You don't have to agree with them. Right. You can get an understanding. And isn't that all we need right now in this country? An understanding. Right. And it's how we deliver. It's, it's, it's truly how we deliver the question. Mm -hmm. And I'm not knocking CNN. I'm not knocking Fox News. I'm not knocking anyone. But it's how we ask the question. You can have anybody on your platform if you ask them in a certain way or if you invite them or if you're not hitting hard. Yeah, we may not. I may not agree with you on everything, you know, but we can sit. We should be able to come and sit at the table. We're so divided right now here. We are so divided, like literally half and half with this past election. There are 75 million people who don't believe that it's legitimate. Literally. Well, some the of them. media, The media will play a huge part. And I have said this a couple of times in my past interviews. Um, the media will play a huge part in bringing America together. A huge part. Well, let's both commit to doing that together. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Angela from the Game Changers. Angela Ward, the Game Changers. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. And I appreciate coming on. And, you know, it's just such a pleasure um, to even to even voices because more conversations need um, more. We need more conversations, conversations like this. And we need it so bad um, to see how that other person thinks. You know, um, there and I want to say this. I'm sorry. I know this is kind of veering off a little bit, but um, there is a local um, conservative hard hardcore radio talk show. And he actually uh, recently got booted off the air, um, but he's actually an independent. Um, he talked a lot of conservative values, but he just he said, I'm just American. I just want what's right. I just want to understand the system a little better. So if we can come to the table and have an understanding, how close will America be if we can just have an understanding? Everybody is not going to understand where a, 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 a young black man that grew up in the ghetto, okay, that was poor, they're uh, in someone that grew up going to private schools in a rich home. They're not going to understand that young black man. But if we can come together and talk about it, think how we will be. They will understand from that conservative mindset that they don't want to spend all their tax money or to for food stamps or whatever. They will understand if they knew the story of that family. So we have to tell more stories and we have to tell the truth. And we have to also be willing to listen. Mm -hmm. I couldn't <laughs> say one more word. To add to that. Thank you. Thank that you. Perfect. Angela, thank you so much for being thank here. You. We could not do this without you. And that's why you are a special bonus to the non-obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so glad we got to add that in. Have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.